Is I think your piece, Mindfulness and Judging, thank you for writing it in 2016. I didn't know that it was the feedback you received that then led to uh, the various offerings. In that piece, as we just talked a little bit about the um, some of the, there's the wellness aspect, right? And I think that even Justice Breyer says at one time he started for reducing blood pressure or just sort of for a health related thing. And you say in the paper that while there's health and wellness benefits and the legal profession is looking to that wellness piece because it's so important, always has been now as much if not more than ever. And of course, within legal education, you said it has obvious implications for the actual work judges do. So what I, if, I, if, if I could, there's a couple of lines from that piece that I'd like to just share, because I think that it's so beautifully written and, and have you comment on what you meant a little bit more fully, sure. because here it gets to the actual work judges do. Mm -hmm. um, and also in terms of being frank, as I sort of mentioned before tongue in cheek with Judge Frank, you really, I think, do have a very self-aware genuine, authentic way of saying, we're human beings, let's try to get this as right, because what we're doing is important and has effects on our lives and others. So you say, um, yet despite these efforts, that is the efforts to do the job very well, almost every experienced judge can think of cases in which a judgment misses the mark, in which the emotional impact of the situation made thoughtful reflection difficult or impossible, or in which there was lingering doubt about whether justice was truly done. So in which the emotional impact of the situation made thoughtful reflection difficult or impossible. Could you share a little bit about that? Sure, sure. No, and I think I think being, you know, this 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 is about judicial humility. And you know, there's people who will joke and say, well, that's an oxymoron. There is no such thing. But you know, is, is the job really tends to make it hard to be humble because you're getting a lot of uh, constant affirmation, whether you deserve it or not. You know, it's like the, the, the job itself leads to that. And so that's where the power becomes a, uh, uh, an issue. But, but part of the humility is realizing you're going to make mistakes. And, and it is, and I like with the way you described it, I mean, what you're trying to do is, is get yourself so that you don't make unforced errors, you know, so that at least, you know, you, you are in as good a shape as you can be, you know, emotionally and mentally and, and psychologically so that you don't make those kinds of mistakes. You're still going to make mistakes because we, none of us are capable of predicting the future. But where, where I really see, where I remember this being the hardest for me, and it wasn't the only place, but I have probably the most stories, uh, was when I was a family law judge. And I think if you talk to people who have served as family law judges, I mean, this is the easiest audience in the world when I'm talking about mindfulness. I mean, back when I go back to, to my teaching days in California that I used to teach family law and I worked with family law judges on how you manage the vicarious trauma and the psychological stress of doing family law cases. And one of the things that's really, really hard about them is that you can't possibly, in, in the time that you have, know all of the dynamics and all the history of a particular family or a particular uh, marriage. And, and, and so you, you, get the, you get a snippet and then, you know, in the cases where people are represented by lawyers, which is a shrinking number, the lawyers tend to distort things because, I mean, not because they're trying to, but I mean, that's just the way it works. I mean, they, they, they do a, they are advocates. And so they're trying to highlight the strengths and minimize the weaknesses and vice versa. And, and in the cases where people are representing themselves, they don't know the rules, they don't know the law. And so you just get sort of the pure unvarnished emotion, uh, which may or may not fit within the, the, the bounds you need to decide. But in any case, you don't know enough to really make a decision that kind of takes into account all of the factors in that particular family. So the result is that you make mistakes. And one of the things that happens is that you can get attached in ways that you don't even realize are happening. And I'll give a specific example so I don't get too abstract. I would find sometimes the cases that were hardest for me were ones where I would look at the relationship between the husband and the wife, and I would project onto that uh, stuff from my own past. 
that I would see people interacting in a particular way, and I would assume that that meant X. Because maybe that's the way my mom and dad are related, you know, or that's the way my wife and I have related, or, you know, that, 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 that there was some way that uh, I, I, it was a combination of not knowing enough, and then we have our own emotional uh, experience within our own family. And, and then you're kind of looking at this other family, and you're making assumptions about what's going on between these people. And sometimes you're wrong. And sometimes, you know, you give custody to the wrong parent, or you make the wrong uh, a visitation arrangement, or you, you don't, you, 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 you assume that somebody is feeling a particular way when actually they're not. And I could think of any number of times when I was a family law judge where I made those kinds of mistakes. And so, so really what you're trying to do is number one, realize that you are going to make those mistakes and it's, you can't avoid it. And, and that's hard, not only because of the power thing, but it's also hard because I think a lot of people who become judges are perfectionists. So, so it's hard to, to face the reality that you are not perfect and that you're going to screw up. But then, you know, to, to try to minimize the chances that you're going to screw up, you need to know yourself pretty well, you know. And, and I've always thought it was very strange that uh, if you want to be a family therapist, in most states, you have to have several thousand hours of clinical training. But you can be a, you can be a judge <laughs> deciding exactly the same case with exactly the same family, and you don't have to have any psychological training whatsoever. Mm -hmm. You know, so that there's no there's no way that your your own particular stuff, your own particular biases, ever get explored. Um, and so and that's where I really started getting interested in this that that being able to see how your own reaction to something is affecting the way you're thinking about it. Um, so having a tool like mindfulness that allows you to, as I said at the very beginning, you know, to sort of untangle those things. Wow. You know, that's, that's pretty powerful. I mean, because it, it, it doesn't mean you don't have unchecked assumptions. It doesn't mean you don't have implicit biases. You still do, but they're less powerful. They're less ubiquitous, mm -hmm. you know, and you gain more mastery of them. You gain more understanding of them. Yes. And so I think that's one of the ways that for judges in particular, Mindfulness is a really powerful tool.